Welcome to the Expositors of Second Baptist Church of Houston, North Campus. The class hosts the teaching ministry of James Brooks. Our mission is to grow in the knowledge of Christ through the expositional teaching of God's Word. We do this by studying the Bible line upon line and verse by verse. We teach sound doctrine as we look at and live out God's unfolding plan of redemption for His Church. Now let's join James in this week's study of God's Holy Word. This morning we're going to continue our study by looking at Ephesians 5 verses 1 through 5 in being imitators of God. Understand this, God wants us to look like, to be like Him. And unfortunately, many in the church are failing in this task. There was a fellow who did a uh, doctorate up at Liberty uh, Seminary uh, here in the last couple of years. And uh, he had to do a couple of surveys and do some research regarding surveys of uh, evangelical Christians uh, regarding uh, ethics and so forth. And uh, it, he found out some very interesting information. Uh, one of the things, and I think we're, this is not you know, new news for us, uh, but he did find that evangelicals divorce uh, at the same rate that people who have no religious affiliation. In other words, the divorce rate for unbelievers is the same as it is for believers. Uh, it's hard to be like God when we are in fact like the world. Uh, his uh, research also found that teenage girls uh, get pregnant and receive abortions just as frequently as non-Christian girls do. Um, he went and did a poll, and it's interesting, it would be some, something similar to polling this class. Uh, the majority of uh, Christians who responded to him were between the ages of 40 and 50, some a few years older, some a few years younger, uh, and the majority of them uh, had claimed to have been Christians for 20 years or more. 20 years or more these folks had been believers. And he asked them a couple of questions. Uh, just a few of the things that he found out, uh, which he again kind of suspected. Out of all of the people that attend church, only 20% of Christians engage in full-time or you know, active ministry, with 80% of people who claim the name of Christ engage in no ministry whatsoever in the church. Now, of those 80%, of the people in the church without a ministry, 70% of those said it was because they lacked the motivation to serve. They lacked the motivation to serve. 54% of those who were leadership in the churches where these things, uh, where these poll figures were, were taken up, uh, stated they did not know how to address the problem. So now you have 80% of the people in the church who are not serving. 70% of them say the reason they don't serve is because they're not motivated. And 54% of those pastors have no clue on how to motivate people into engaging in the ministry of others. And 32% of those surveyed said the reason they don't really engage in, in ministry in the church is because after all, in the final analysis, everything's going to be equal in heaven, regardless of how we lived here. As long as we're Christians, it's going to be the same for everyone. That's the prevailing thought. That's what we're dealing with as a community of believers. How in the world are we expected to live like Christ when the world is ignorant of what God expects of us or they are apathetic in the sense that they don't care. What does God say about that? What does God say about uh, our commitment to Him? How uh, we should be living? Well, follow along with me as I read Ephesians chapter 5, verses 1 through 5, in a section that could be easily uh, labeled How to Be Imitators of God, because God expects us to be imitators of Him. In verse 1 of chapter 5, he writes, Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children, and walk in love just as Christ also loved you and gave Himself up for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God as a fragrant aroma. 
But do not let immorality or any impurity or greed even be named among you as is proper among the saints. And there must be no filthiness and silly talk or coarse jesting, which are not fitting, but rather giving of thanks. For this you know with certainty, that no immoral or impure person or covetous man who is an idolater has an inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Well, let's pray. Our Father and our God, we come to You this morning and we just pray that the Spirit of God would remove uh, the thoughts and the cares of this life and allow us to concentrate upon You and Your Word. We pray that the Spirit of God would teach us mightily and with the result that we would go out and apply the things that we're learning. And we ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. So God wants us to be imitators of Him. And if we look at these first five verses, it becomes clear that there are at least three things uh, that we can do to ensure that we become imitators of God. It re- the first uh, three verses, uh, we need to guard our walk. That is how we live our lives. We need to guard our words, the things that we're talking about. You know, Paul finished up in chapter 4 talking about how we are to use our tongue. Um, and now here we are beginning chapter 5 and he's back on the tongue again. So apparently it's something that we really struggle with and it's something that God really wants to emphasize uh, in telling us how we are to be imitators of Him. And then in verse 5 we'll look at see, uh, look and see how we are to guard our inheritance. Guard our inheritance. We are to imitate God. First and foremost we see here in verse 1. We are to imitate God in our actions. Now let me ask you this. What does it mean to imitate? The word imitate here comes from the Greek word uh, mimetes. This is the plural form of it. But it's the Greek word mimetes. And it means uh, to, to mimic. It means to mimic. If I could translate using the James Brooks translation based upon what the Greek the Greek text says, because the verb there is a second personal plural middle passive imperative verb, which simply means y'all allow yourselves to mimic God. As a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, allow yourself, that is allow the Holy Spirit of God to fill you with the result that you are imitating God. Well, what does it mean to mimic? Association, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, here I am. <laughs> here I am, another one of these dang press dinners. Could be home asleep. Little Barney curled up at my feet. But no. I gotta pretend I like being here. <laughs> the media really ticks me off. <laughs> the way they try to embarrass me by not editing what I say. <laughs> well, let's get things going or I'll never get to bed. Now we see then by looking at that, and I know that's uh, somewhat used to be a uh, comedic spectacle, but we see that to mimic then means to look like, to resemble, to speak like, to have the same mannerisms and so forth. And that's the way God expects us as His children to be like Him. But to be like Him in our conduct and to be like Him in our character. The command, therefore, then, is to be like God in character and conduct. And how do we do that? Well, he tells us here by verse 2, walking in love. Walking in love. Now, to walk uh, comes from the word peripateo, which means to how we arrange and live our life. That is reflective of the, Paul, uh, the term that Paul uses to mean walk. 
how we are to arrange and live our lives regarding all moral and ethical decisions that you and I make on a day-to-day basis. And the basis of how we are to walk is to walk in love. Now the word love there comes from the word agape. Agape. And what is agape love? Because the Bible talks about uh, two and mentions three types of love, one in the negative, uh, but there are different nuances to the term love. A lot of times, specifically in American culture in the 21st century, uh, people like to think that there's uh, emotions and those types of things. I mean, those of you who uh, are ever channel surfing and see programs like The Bachelor or The Bachelorette or these other type of uh, shows, uh, you'll see people on there talking about, you know, falling into love. I fell into love with that person. And then, or conversely, they'll say, I've fallen out of love with that person. What they're talking about is, I don't get my glands stirred by being around this person like I once did when we first met. And they're equating that with love. Now, that's not what Paul uses here. That is not the biblical term uh, for love uh, regarding the term agape. Agape love is a steadfast commitment of the well-being towards another person. Regardless of how the action may be reciprocated, meaning regardless of how another person responds to you, every one of you in here need to know there's absolutely nothing that you can do to prevent me from loving you. Nothing. Nothing you can do to prevent that. Now, you may not respond to me in kind, But that's on you. That's not on me. I am to look after your best interest, your well-being at all times. That's what God commands. It has nothing to do with how I emotionally feel about people. It has nothing to do with my affections of people. Now, obviously, I would want to have affections for some people because uh, affections and so forth and feelings are drawn together in relationships based on commonality of interest. Meaning, the more you're with a person the more you can develop the similar interest. And that comes to our other type of love, the phileo type of love, that's based upon levels of intimacy in one's relationship. But that's not what uh, agape is. Rather, agape love is an act of goodness towards another person. And God says we are to walk in love. Consider what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5, verse 44, when He says, But I say to you, agapao, which is the verb form of agape, which is a noun, but I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Husbands, wives, think about this. If you've ever tried to think and say, well, maybe we need to go to marriage counseling and so forth, um, because the wife will say, well, I just don't love you anymore. Or the husband will say, I just don't love you anymore. The first question, if you come to me with that type of uh, statement, will, my question to you will be, are you enemies? No, we're not enemies. Okay, well, Jesus said, love your enemies. So if you're not enemies, but yet you're saying you're not able to love each other, your problem is not with the ability to love, your problem is with the obedience to love. It's a sin problem. It's a sin issue. Because we are commanded to love one another. Jesus will go on to say in Matthew 22, this is the great and foremost commandment. And the second is just like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. And who is my neighbor? That's a question that was asked of Jesus. And the response is, anyone who comes within your sphere of influence with whom you have the ability to minister, that is your neighbor. And again, in Matthew 5, Jesus said, For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? Meaning, how can you say that your life has been set apart by God and that there's something different about you than there is with the world when if you just love those who love you, after all, people in the world will do that. 
How do you make that distinguishing characteristic between Christian love and the world uh, type of love? So we are to walk in love. That's how we imitate God. And then he tells us we are to walk in love by a measure. And what is that measure? The measure is just as Christ loved us, that's how we are to walk in love. So the question is, well, how much did Christ love us? Because that's the standard by which we are to love uh, each other. Romans 5, Paul writes this, For when we were helpless at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. For one will hardly die for a righteous man, though perhaps for the good man someone would dare even to die. But God demonstrates His own love toward us in that while we were still still sinners, Christ died for us. Christ died for us when there was nothing unlovable about us. That is the deep and great love with which He loved us in that there was nothing we could do uh, for us to earn God's love. Um, Consider what uh, John the Revelator writes in Revelation 1. And from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth, to Him who loves us and released us from our sins by His blood, and He has made us to be a kingdom, priest to His God and Father. To Him be the glory and the dominion forever. Amen. So, Christ loved us with a sacrificial love. Christ loved us as we were unlovable. And He offered Himself as payment for our sins. Yes, sir? James, would you say that love is the purpose and fulfillment of the moral law? Yes. Uh, The question is, is love the purpose and the fulfillment of the moral law? And the answer to that question is yes. Uh, Consider what Paul writes in Romans 4. He who was delivered over because of our transgressions. That is, Christ was nailed upon the cross because of the sins of those for whom He came to die and bear their sins in order to make them justified. That is, when Christ was on the cross, Christ, that is, the Father, treated Him as if He were me, So that when He died upon the cross, all of my sins and your sins were placed upon Him so that now God treats me as if I were Him. And how do we know that God was satisfied with that payment? Because Paul tells us, He was raised because of, that is our purpose, He was raised for the purposes of my justification. For your justification in order that God looks at you and says, not guilty, positionally. Paul then goes on to say in 2 Corinthians, He made Him, that is Christ, who knew no sin, to be sin on our behalf. Why? So that we might become the righteousness of God in Him. As such, Paul tells us here back in Ephesians, we are to avoid lustful sin patterns. Verse 3, But do not let immorality or impurity or greed even be named among you as it is proper among the saints. The word there for immorality is the Greek word pornea, from where we get our English word pornography. And fundamentally it means any sexual activity in thought or in deed that is different from what God has set up according to the mandates of biblical marriage. Therefore, pornea would consist of homosexual relationships. Pornea would consist of bestiality, pedophilia, uh, any type of aberrant sexual union that's out there. Uh, if it falls with outside the confines of marriage, uh, it falls under the heading of uh, pornea. Uh, impurity. Paul tells us is that there should be no impurity named among us. It comes from the Greek word which means anything that has to do with worldly living. Anything that you engage in that fundamentally leaves God out. It used to be used as a cultic expression of a religious term and as time progressed it became associated and Paul begins to use it as anything that is contrary to godly living. Consider what he writes in Romans 6. He says, I am speaking in human terms because of the weaknesses of your flesh. 
For just as you presented your members as slaves to impurity, there's our term, and to lawlessness, resulting in further lawlessness, so now present your members as slaves to righteousness, resulting in your sanctification. And then the last term that he uses here is the word greed. Greed. And it comes from the Greek word that means to desire what other people have regardless whether you need it or not. It's to covet something someone else has in order that you can acquire that with a view to having a sense that you're okay in the eyes of other people. I mean, this is no different than what we see all the way back in the Garden of Evil, uh, Garden of Eden. <laughs> Garden of, it was the Garden of Evil. <laughs> the Garden of Eden. Um, but to covet something means to want to desire what another person has to desire what another per person has with an ultimate view to uh, being viewed, uh, having a sense of significance and value based upon how you perceive the people respond to you if you had that stuff. Uh, consider what Jesus said in Luke 12. He said to them, Beware, and be on your guard against every form of greed. There's our term. He says, For not even when one has an abundance does his life consist in his possessions. In other words, you shouldn't want what other people have. You shouldn't desire to, be covet, uh, to covet what other people have because even if you were to have it, your life does not consist in the abundance of things. I mean, how many times have you watched the news at 6 o'clock? And you'll see a house fire or a warehouse fire or something like that, and people will come up, and you know the the cameraman will come up to them, and they'll say, you know, and, and very distraught, you know, my whole life's gone, my whole life was in that building. Beloved, life does not consist in the abundance of stuff. So, what then does my life consist? The sum of one's life, now we've talked about this before, so this part should be a review for you. But the sum of your life comprises three things. It comprises your thoughts, your words, and your actions or your deeds. All three of those things will ultimately be evaluated one day by Christ at the judgment seat of Christ for those of you who are uh, believing. Ultimately, that's going to pan out in either one of two things. Rewards and inheritance or loss of rewards and inheritance. Rewards or inheritance or loss of... Yes, sir. Rewards and inheritance. I was reading last week about Christ's death and He was our propitiation. It says in Timothy. Mm -hmm. And it kind of stressed that it wasn't just that He was our sacrifice, but He satisfied the wrath of God. So I guess that would be what means. Yes. To satisfy the wrath of God more than just sacrifice. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's, a, that's a, a, one of the reasons why I hold uh, to the view of atonement that I hold to. Uh, what Jimmy said is when you look up the word propitiation and you understand the significance that it's not just making a sacrifice, but it's actually satisfying the, the wrath of God. Moreover that, it's actually a purchasing as well uh, because uh, the biblical writers use the term that Christ purchased us, agorazo, to purchase out of the slave market of sin by His own blood. So the death of Christ definitely accomplished much more than just the idea of He made a sacrifice. Uh, so good, good, uh, good point on that. Okay, so we're to guard our walk. We're to guard our words. And this is where we're going to spend the majority of our time. We are also... Oh, let me jump ahead there. Uh, we are to guard our words. Let me go back. Um, what Paul is saying is that very similar to what he's already told us in chapter 4, we are to use godly and wholesome speech at all times. That means no dirty jokes, no sexual innuendos as we talk, no double entendres at the expense of other people to make them you know, appear to be foolish and so forth. Paul tells us that coarse jokes and profane speech are sin. Why? Because its content is void of godly edification. And that's the primary concern why God wants us to use our tongue and our mouth is to bring uh, glory to Him and to edify those with whom we come in contact. 
primarily the saints that we saw in chapter 4. You cannot love your neighbor, you cannot love your neighbor as you are tearing him or her down with words. You cannot love your neighbor if you're tearing him down with words. Consider what Paul writes in Romans 6. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its lust, and do not go on presenting yourself, uh, presenting the members of your body as, uh, to sin as instruments of unrighteousness, meaning your tongue. Don't use parts of your body as instruments of unrighteousness in the tearing down of another person through coarse jesting. But rather, present yourself to God as those alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. So we are to guard our walk. We are to guard our words. And then finally here, we are to guard our inheritance. Look at verse 5. For this you know with certainty that no immoral or impure person or covetous man who is an idolater has an inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. What Paul is saying is do not live like an unbeliever. Do not live like an unbeliever. And why is that? Because Paul is concerned about our inheritance. Paul is concerned about our inheritance. What is it, uh, what's the significance of the inheritance here in this passage? Um, there are two plausible, there's more than that, but there's at least two, I think, that are very plausible uh, regarding how, how and what Paul is uh, uh, explaining uh, here regarding inheritance. The first is that Paul simply could be stating, and there are many Reformed uh, brothers and sisters um, who hold this particular view, but basically what Paul is doing is that he's stating that unbelievers have no inheritance in the kingdom of God, therefore you should not do as they do because they have no inheritance. And that's true. And, and Paul uh, could very well be using that as a, uh, a motivating factor for telling people in the church, look, they don't have an inheritance so don't live like them. But when I think you take in the preponderance of the evidence from all that Paul teaches regarding rewards and inheritance, that he's actually saying a little bit more. Uh, in fact, that Paul is stating that we run the risk of forfeiting our reward and inheritance, and it's something that's a very real risk for believers who refuse to live and be like God. Now, the thing that we have to ask ourselves before we start talking about rewards and inheritance, is there even any distinction? Here in this very church, not in this room, but in this very church, I was teaching for another teacher one day who was out of class, and uh, I was going over something, I forget specifically what it was, but it was dealing with the judgment seat of Christ, 1 Corinthians chapter 3. And I had a lady come up to me afterwards and said, you know, I don't agree with anything that you said during that. And I said, well, I, I appreciate you not just interrupting the class and calling me a heretic right there on the spot. I appreciate that. Uh, she said, but I don't believe that there are different levels like you're talking about in heaven. I think, you know, once we get there, it's going to be great for everybody and everybody's going to be the same. And I didn't really want to push it because I'm not, you know, wasn't there a sign teacher and so on. I recommended a couple of books to her, but I told her, I said, you really need to go back and beginning with the Gospels, actually beginning with the Old Testament, and look at how many times an inheritance is, is guaranteed or promised by God, but whether the person acquires that uh, inheritance or reward is always going to be based upon the obedience of the person with whom God engages in that type of contract. And it's all throughout Scripture. Consider what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 18. He said, Whoever then humbles himself as this child, as he put this child before him, he is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. You cannot have the greatest unless you have something lesser than the greatest. Re of distinction. Yes, sir? What do you mean by inheritance? I'll, I'll get there. Thank you for asking. Yes, sir? And I think, too, the distinction has to be between <laughs> eternal salvation and mm -hmm. you know, rewards in heaven, too. Because yeah. we're not talking about salvation here. 
Right, yeah, I'm, I'm getting there too. <laughs> I knew that was going to generate. This is to kind of wet your whistle, so to speak. Uh, in Luke chapter 7, Jesus said this in regards to John the Baptist. He said, I say to you, uh, uh, to you among those born of women, there is no one greater than John. That is John the Baptist. You'll recall when we were going through uh, the Gospels, you know, I had a little section called The Greatest Man Apart from Christ Who Ever Lived. And you say, John the Baptist was the greatest man? Well, Jesus said, among everyone born, John is the greatest person who ever lived. And yet, he who is least in the kingdom of God is greater than he. So there is distinction. There is distinction in the kingdom. Again, this is not Jimmy. This is uh, Jody Dillo. <laughs> and his book uh, regarding uh, the comparison between rewards, uh, or excuse me, inheritance. What does it mean? Does it mean going to heaven, or does it mean something else? Consider what he writes. He says, In every instance where the process of inheriting the kingdom of earth is mentioned, and it's five times in the New Testament, it is always inherited by means of works. So that ought to raise up red flags right there. Salvation is by grace alone, by means of faith alone, in Christ alone. Salvation is faith plus nothing. So as such, whenever you start to see verses that talk about works and those types of things, uh, if you're not quite sure what he's, the context of what he's talking about, start asking those questions to yourself. What does the person have to do to gain this inheritance? And Dillo says, It is always associated with character qualities which come as an act of obedience. We are told in Colossians 3, for example, that our future inheritance comes to us as a reward for obedience. Paul writes in Colossians 3, Whatever you do, do your work heartily as for the Lord rather than for men. Why? knowing that from the Lord you will receive the reward. Antipodosis is the word in the Greek text. And it means you will receive compensation or the payment of what is due. Christ is going to pay each one according to what He has done, whether good or bad. The payment of what is due. Nothing in there about grace. We're saved by grace alone, in faith alone, in Christ alone. However, inheritance is based upon how good, uh, how well you are working in the service of the King. It is the Lord Christ whom you serve, Paul says. And these are those five verses there. Uh, Matthew 25, uh, the phrase is, Take your inheritance. In the context there, he's talking about caring for believers in the tribulation. This is not on your page there. I didn't have enough to do it without making three pages. But uh, if you want a copy, I can, I'll email it out to everyone today. Uh, 1 Corinthians 6 talks about inheriting the kingdom. Paul does. And it's based upon having godly character. Ephesians 5, which is our passage here, talks about demonstrating godly character. Galatians 5, which is the sister uh, epistle, if you will, to uh, here, is refraining from sinful acts results in inheriting the kingdom. And then again in Matthew 5.5, 5, inheriting to the kingdom is based upon demonstrating meekness, which is demonstrating a work. <coughs> also, aspects of our inheritance includes crowns. Now we've talked about that extensively at another time, so I won't uh, do that again here, but just to let you know that there are five, uh, six crowns, Looking at five verses, six crowns. Six crowns that the Bible tells us uh, that we can acquire for uh, faithful service. Now, this is the part that seems to confuse a lot of people, so we're going to kind of slow it down just a bit and go through these uh, few verses here. Our inheritance also includes our ruling and reigning with Christ. You see, we're not just all going to show up to heaven one day with a little harp and get these little wings on the back and sit on a cloud and sit around and sing Kumbaya. Uh, 
uh, we are going to be just as busy there, uh, more so, than we are here. It's just there we'll have an imperishable body, body, we won't get tired, and we'll be able to explore the glories of the Lord for the rest of eternity. And I look forward to that day. But based upon what we do now, will yield its consequence during the Millennial Kingdom and even into the eternal state. And one aspect of that will be our ruling and reigning with Christ. Consider what Jesus said to the disciples in Luke 22. He said, You are those who, stood, who have stood by me in my trials, and just as my Father has granted me a kingdom, I grant you that, that you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom, and you will sit on thrones judging the twelve tribes of Israel. He's talking to the disciples. So he's telling them that they are going to be distinct in the sense that they will have some capacity of ruling as a co-regent with Christ. 1 Corinthians 6, Paul writing to the church, he says this, Or do you not know that saints, that's you, will judge the world? If the world is judged by you, are you not competent to constitute the smallest Law courts? You see, they were taking each other to court, and Paul's admonition to them was, look, one of these days, God is going to expect that we are going to judge the world. That's a huge responsibility. You know, you're over here messing around with things that are to be settled in small claims court when you're going to be dealing and judging matters that go all the way up to the Supreme Court. And you're going to be the judge. That's the appeal that he is making. 1 Corinthians 6.3 Do you not know that we will judge angels? How much more matters of this life? Remember, beloved, when Lucifer rebelled against God and left heaven, one-third of the angels went with him. They have been confined. Many of them, some of them, have been confined. Some of them will be released during the tribulation period. Others of them will be permanently confined. But that's going to require a lot of responsibility in judging and passing sentence on the angelic realm. And what Paul is stating is that somehow, some way, we as the church are going to participate in that event. In Revelation chapter 20, <clears throat> speaking of the time during the tribulation period, we won't be here. If you're here this morning and you haven't accepted Christ yet, if the rapture happens, pay attention because you will be here for this. Then I saw thrones of the saints, and they sat on them, and judgment was given to them. And I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded because of their testimony of Jesus and because of the Word of God, and those who would not worship the beast or his image and had not received the mark on their forehead and on their hand, and they came to life and reigned with Christ for a thousand years." Those are believers who during the tribulation period will refuse to worship the Antichrist and as such they're going to have their heads chopped off um, as a form of punishment for not bowing down to the Antichrist. Is that something like that almost impossible to believe? With everything going on in the world today? No. Revelation 3. He who overcomes, that is... Uh, the overcoming one, that's a, a singular participle. The overcoming one, I will grant to him to sit down with me on my throne as I also overcame and sat down with my Father on his throne. So the rulership that the Father gave to Christ is the rulership that Christ gives to us as a co-regent with him, depending upon what? If we overcome. He who overcomes, same thing. The singular participle, the overcoming one, will inherit these things, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. And then in Revelation 2, And the one who conquers and who continues in my deeds until the end, I will give him authority over the nations. I will give him authority over the nations, ruling and reigning with Christ. That's why we should not live like an unbeliever. Moreover, if we live like an unbeliever, not only uh, could we potentially forfeit ruling and reigning with Christ, but we also run the risk of facing temporal discipline. For example, we won't look at these for the sake of time. There's three great examples in the New Testament. Ananias and Sapphira who lied to the Holy Spirit, trying to make themselves to look rather holy in front of the church. And as such, God took their life right there in the church house. 
Secondly, we have believers at Corinth who are taking the Lord's Supper in an irreverent manner. As such, God killed them. That is, He took their physical life. And then finally, in 1 John 5, and don't ask me the question, what is the sin unto death? I don't know. Uh, but John says, the Christian who commits a sin unto death, don't pray for that don't pray for that person because God has determined it as a uh, process of spiritual discipline. He's going to take that person's physical life so that they can't do any more damage down here on earth. Yes, sir? Did you say the first one is the only biblical example of someone being slain in the Spirit? <laughs> the question is, is that the first biblical example of someone being slain in the Spirit? Uh, to use the proper terminology, Yes. Um, different type of slaying though. They will not get back up off the floor. Uh, we also run the risk of loss of our rewards. Uh, consider what John writes in Second John. He says, Watch yourselves that you do not lose what we have accomplished, but that you may receive a full reward. The word there in the Greek is mistos for the reward. And again, it means your, your payment of what is due you. Uh, that the term reward there is is actually a terrible thing because rewards generally are something that uh, that you give you know running a race and so forth. Uh, everyone who runs the race, but not everyone gets the reward. Only the one who wins the race. Uh, reward or the term mistos has more of the idea of getting what you earn. In other words, everybody in here is earning something. The mistos or the reward will be what Christ gives you as a result of what you've earned. And he even says in Revelation 22, Behold, I am coming quickly, and my reward is with me to render to every man according to what he has done. We will all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. That's why Paul in his uh, admonitions could say this in 1 Corinthians 9. He said, uh, I don't run with uncertainty or box like one who hits only the air. Meaning, I'm not wasting my time. I'm not doing things uh, in the here and now uh, that are fruitless. Instead, I subdue my body and make it my slave. Why? Because it's through His body that He sins. If we're going to engage in sin, it's through our body, our flesh, our faculties through which we sin. And what he says is, is that he has, to, he has to make his flesh his slave so that after preaching to others about rewards and inheritance, and much like what I'm doing with you folks this morning, make my body my slave so that after I preach to you, I myself do not become disqualified. What do you mean become disqualified? Forfeit what could have been mine because of fleshly living and sin. After all, even James says, you who are teachers will incur a stricter judgment. If someone's work is burned up, if someone's work is forfeited, he will suffer loss, though he will be saved, that is, from the penalty of sin. You're not going to lose your salvation, but the smell of smoke will be on you as though you were uh, passing through fire. 2 Corinthians 5, Paul says this, We must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each one may be paid back according to what he has done while in the body, whether good or evil. Everyone's going to give an account. And I know this is going to be reviewed for some of you. And I used to feel guilty thinking to myself, is there another way I can come up with these different little paradigms and notes and so forth? But the thing I notice is that God is constantly repeating Himself over and over and over again. And I wondered about that. And then I realized the reason God repeats Himself over and over and over again, it's not enough for me just to tell you one time, okay, I know you got it. Human nature is not like that. We need to be told, this is the way, walk in it. And then a little while later, we need to be told, this is the way, walk in it. This is the way, walk in it. Same thing with the paradigm here. This is kind of the big picture of how it all works. Every day, every day, you are having tests of faith or trials. They're all different types of trials, all different types of tests, but every day when we wake up, God is giving us a pop quiz. And what He wants to know is, how are you handling life? He already knows, but the pop quiz or test is to ensure that you know where you are. If you respond on the basis of biblical and moral ethics... That is, we are to walk in love. 
then he tells us that what results as a product of that is spiritual growth, maturity, and life. Now, if we want to be like the Israelites and spend 40 years out walking in the desert, walking around Mount Sinai, singing just a closer walk with thee, and yet not growing, and have fleshly responses, then what we experience is immobility, immaturity, fleshly living, and experiential death. That's the product. That's the fruit of... That's the temporal reward of living in disobedience. Now, some people have asked me in the past, well, what is experiential death? Experiential death is a state of being where the believer lives according to the principles and practices of the world that are contrary to God's Word. Fundamentally, it is living according to the flesh, which is living one's life void of God. We see examples of it. For example, Paul says in Romans 6.6 6, that when uh, we present ourselves to someone, we present ourselves as slaves to someone for obedience. You are slaves to the one with whom you obey, he says. Either of sin resulting in death, and there's the concept of experiential death. Because if you're a slave to sin, you're a slave uh, which results in death. You're not dying. And if you're a believer, you're already saved from the penalty of sin. So in what sense is he using death? And that's what it is, experiential death. Okay. A few more verses that you have there. Uh, but we're running out of time, so I need to finish up. Um, if you, for example, uh, one of these days, uh, each of us are going to either face physical death or we are going to face the judgment uh, rapture and the judgment seat of Christ. One of those two things are gonna, we're going to you know, ultimately get to. Uh, it's going to be up on God's timetable and calendar for us. Now the way it works is, is if we have lived a life that has been pleasing to God, where we have made biblical responses, where we have grown and we have been serviceable and uh, have served the Lord with joy and with gladness, then at the Bema, 1 Corinthians 3, God is going to reward us with rewards and inheritance to include those crowns, the ruling and the reigning, and the uh, proximity of relationship uh, in the millennial kingdom to the Lord and even in the eternal state. Now, if we are fleshly in our responses, meaning are you saved? Yes. Are you saved from the penalty of sins? Yes. Are you going to go to heaven? Yes. Is everything going to be uh, great there? In your experience, yes. But you will forfeit what could have been yours had you chosen to live godly and grow up in the faith. And Christ says that every thought, every word, every deed, the product of your life will be evaluated at the Bema with the result that you will lose what could have been yours. So if anything, beloved, understand this. Because Paul tells us, life is serious business. Life is serious business. If there was something that we need to concentrate upon as we leave today, then simply this. As you go out this week, live your life, that is to walk as Jesus walked. question is, well, how did Jesus walk? It's right here in the book. Every moral decision that you have to come across, it's going to be right in here. The answer is, walk as Jesus walked. Talk as Jesus talked. Speak the truth. Edify each other. Don't use your tongue for an opportunity to sin by tearing down another brother or sister in Christ or even an unbeliever. And then finally, live your life as if every day counted for something because Paul makes it clear, beloved, that it does. And one of these days we're all going to stand before Christ and we will give an account for how we have lived with the resources and the talents that God has given to us. Did we squander those things by covering them up and not using them? Or did we invest into His kingdom by investing into the lives of each other, resulting in their spiritual growth and ours? I pray that that's your goal. Well, let's pray.